And the makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening, this is Orson Welles. One of this season's bestsellers, Wickford Point, by last year's Pulitzer Prize winner, John P. Marquand, is the Campbell Playhouse selection as the best new book for me, a choice which will probably surprise nobody. Wickford Point is the story of that immovable object known as an old family. And believe me, the Brills are as entertaining and as plausibly improbable a collection of American ghouls as you've ever encountered. The Brills are quite a story, but we'll leave them, I'm afraid, tonight pretty much as we found them. For candied fruit never spoils, and the Brills are put up like preserves in the past, hermetically sealed, fixed in a thick syrup which is family pride. They bear charmed lives, these people from the past, these enchanted islanders from the ever-ever lands of yesterday, these heartbreak householders like the Brills from Whitford Point. They will never grow old, and they were never young. They are exactly as ageless as a pickle. The Brill variety will be new to you, but not entirely unfamiliar. All the incidents and characters in this story are entirely fictitious, and no reference is intended to actual persons living or dead. The uh, Campbell Playhouse resorts to this prudent incantation because it turns out that almost anybody in New England can tell you just who the Brills really are. Of course, there are several versions, so we've asked an authority to settle the dispute for us at the end of tonight's broadcast. He's the best authority we could find. He is not a Brill. He swears he is not a Brill. He is John P. Marquand, the author. But now, just before we begin, a word from Ernest Chapel. Let me ask what comes to your mind when I mention chicken for dinner. <laughs> I think I know. You visualize a fine, plump chicken sizzling brown and falling into tender slices under the touch of the carving knife. And you recall the eager anticipation as the plates were passed from place to place. Ah, <laughs> grand dish, chicken. A special occasion treat that's always welcome. But remember that between these special occasions, your family can still enjoy the good taste of chicken soup. Because just as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. You'll see how chicken-rich it is in the very golden glisten of it. You'll taste deep-down chicken flavor in every tempting spoonful. What's more, you'll find pieces of tender chicken meat in it and fluffy, snowy rice. I know you'll agree that Campbell's is the real old-fashioned kind of chicken soup. Why not keep several cans of Campbell's chicken soup on hand? And now for the Orson Welles production of Wickford Point. Morning, Jim. Good morning, Sam. Say, Jim, have you ever noticed the high surface tension of coffee? I think this coffee's been boiled too long. It's been on the back of the stove for four hours. Yeah, I can tell by watching it drip from the spoon. How's no, your stomach, Sid? Well, I lay in the sun on the beach all day yesterday. As long as I'm perfectly still in the sun, I seem to be all right. Uh, by the way, Jim, I borrowed some of your socks this morning. I haven't gotten around to doing the washing. Where's Bella? Upstairs. Joe Stowe called up. Joe? Didn't call Bella up, did he? No, me. Wants to meet me in Boston. Bella went upstairs to listen in on the extension. Oh, snake. What's that you said, Oh, never mind. You called me a snake. Jim, the only one on this place who can call me names. Besides, why shouldn't I listen when my ex-husband called? Now, look here, Bella. You I... listen to me, Sid. I've sat around long enough seeing you dribble coffee and hearing about your belly aches. You think you're a genius, don't you? Well, you're just too lazy to move. What did you do with that ten dollars you took out of my pocketbook yesterday? I don't know. I forget. You forget. Oh, what's the use? I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to spend the night over at the Jacobs. If you're driving into Boston, you'll drop me off, won't you, darling? Yes, I'll drop you off. In the ocean with a stone around your neck. Shut up, kid. Well, so long, Jim. See you when you get by. Jim, are you really going to New York? Yes, I'm driving down. Why, darling? Why should you be going to New York? Business. I'm, I'm going to see my agent. Oh, is that all? Yes, of course that's all. It wouldn't be that Pat Lincoln has been calling you again. I wouldn't like to have her telephone bill. Now listen, honeybee. Oh, good morning, Cousin Cotill. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Bella. Listen, Mother, I wish you'd tell Jim. I'm glad you're down to breakfast, Margie. It's fast the coffee, Bella. Jim, have you got a cigarette? I 
gave you all mine last night, Cousin. Yeah, Cousin, I was taking my cigarettes. I don't know what happens to all the cigarettes in the house. I don't know what happens to anything. So it's a lot of cigarettes and a lot of soap and there isn't any gin. Somebody must take it all. It must be the cook's little girl. It might be that man who comes around selling fish. I knew of a plumber once who stole a quart of whiskey. Listen, Jim, I'm going up to change my dress. Don't leave without me. I won't. You've got exactly ten minutes. I'll be down. All right. Oh, dear, I wish Bella wouldn't drop everything everywhere. By the way, I thought that Mr. Berg she brought into lunch last weekend was delightful, didn't you? No, I didn't. We needed some money in the family and a little peasant blood. You know, I'm glad Bella can attract men. It's always much nicer when there are men around. Everyone is much happier and much less nervous. I wish you wouldn't be so hard on President Roosevelt, dear. President Roosevelt? I haven't been hard on President you Roosevelt. Perhaps you haven't yet, but you were going to be. I should have voted for him if I'd remembered to register. I never have remembered to register. I know he'll look out for me. I can see it from his face. And he'll look out for you. Well, someone has to. Jim, who was that letter from this morning? It looked so interesting. She writes the same way I do. I always did have such trouble with my writing until I just stopped trying. It's from a girl in New York. Her name's Patricia Layton. I don't think you know her. Oh, darling, I've never even heard you mention her. No, I don't believe you have. Well, she writes the same way I do. When are you leaving, Jim? Joe Stowe wants me to meet him in Boston. Dinner. Joe Stowe? Yeah. He's on his way to Vermont. Does Bella know? Yes, yeah, she knows. Did Joe, my love. Why do that? After what you did to him, you and the other Brills. Joe and Bella might still be married if you had... Darling, I didn't do anything. I know you love him, but it was all a mistake, his marrying Bella. Give Joe my love. He'll understand. I do wish you weren't going away, darling. No, I'll be back. You're always going away somewhere, aren't you? If you aren't going away somewhere, you're always reading something. Why can't you stay here? You're one of the children, dear. You're part of Wickford Point. You're the only one that ever looked out for me. Oh, Jim, I wish you'd read this. It's a letter from the bank. I don't understand it. I understand it. You've overdrawn your account again. Give me a match, please. No, not that box. It's only his burn matches in it. The other box, just there. The bank is wrong. I sent them $100 last week. It's very stupid of him. Well, I'm leaving now, Cousin Cassell. Oh, dear, then you really are going. You will come back, won't you, Jim? Of course I'll come back. I'll only be gone a few days. Bella! Bella! I'll be right home. Bye, Frida. Bye, Mr. Calder. Dear, I don't like it when you're not here. Jim, you're the only one that ever looked out for you. I just don't want to come back. I'll come back, cousin Cecil. I'll be back on Friday. Well, Cheryl, will clean this car occasionally. Uh, Bella! I'm Bella! Where are you? Oh, oh, come on, honeybee. Let's get started. <laughs> Earl! Earl! Yes, Mr. Jim? Earl, what happened to gas in this car? I had a full tank last night. I guess Mr. Jim must have taken it. He went down to the beach just now in the other car. Mr. Jim's got a rubber tube in his car. He's just it down. I see. They didn't believe you none at all, Mr. Jim. Doesn't look that way. How am I going to get out of here? Get away when Mr. Brill gets back. Say, Mr. Jim, nobody's paid me yet. Well, you asked Mrs. Brill about it. Bella! I did ask Bella! Me. I did Bella! Ask Mr. Jim. He has to wait for the first of the night. Maybe there'll be enough gas to get me to the main Bobby, road. Can you dress, Jim? It's nice. Now, come on. Jim, yes? Can I have a dollar? Come on, get in. You see, Jim, I was in plenty of time. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Mr. Jim. Yeah. yeah. Yes? What is it, Cousin Cotill? Yes, I'm coming back. Goodbye. Yes, Cousin Cotill. Orange kiss. Orange kiss. Will you please bring me that chocolate? Yes, sir. Bye. And Mr. Jim. You haven't brought me that copy of two romance yet. Yes. Goodbye, darling. Chocolate nut bar. Goodbye. Chocolate nut bar. Goodbye. Oh, Jim, I've forgotten my place. I, I thought it was in this bag. You don't want to go back, do you? No. Let me come down with you. All right. You're all sick and darling. It's nice to get out of this good point, isn't it? Yes. Everybody gets so screwy down there, they just sit and sit. You wouldn't be getting out of Wickford Point because you just heard your friend Howard Berg was at the Jekylls, would you? Jim, darling. You're so silly. Bella. Tell me, what do you know about this Howard Berg? Where'd you pick him up? Just in case you want to know, Howard Berg is one of the most important men in war. Who told you so? Berg and who else? Lots of other people you don't know, darling. Lots of people you couldn't possibly know. Who wouldn't care to meet you? The important people? Yes, important hmm. people. And it might be a help. You. It just happens that Howard Berg could help you a great deal. 
Carl Baker, the very intimate friend of Sinclair Lewis, and his coming away, Bruce Hawkinson and James Brown Cabell. How do you like that, darling? Uh, is he an intimate friend of John Galsworthy? It just happens that he had lunch with Mr. Galsworthy last week when Mr. Galsworthy was over from England. Now, butter that on your dry toast, darling. Well, maybe I'm wrong about Mr. Burke. You're quite sure he had lunch with Mr. Galsworthy last week? Right. You didn't happen to know, honeybee, that John Galsworthy died five years ago. It doesn't do any good to lie like that, Jim. Just because no one is found now, there's no really worthwhile writer, no really worthwhile anything is ever honored you by as a person. Is Berg going to be at the J. Coles? Suppose you ask when you get there, darling. Thanks, I will. Bella, come on, come across with her. Has Berg asked you to marry him or not? Please don't, Jim. Please. Jim, I, I can't go on like that. I don't suppose you can. I can't. I, I just can't stand it. I, I can't. I can't. Uh, no, don't. Oh, don't be so disagreeable. Nobody does anything about anything. I can't go on like this. All I want is to be happy and... Jim, what are you going to say to Joe? What do you mean, what am I going to say to Joe? I mean about me. There probably won't be anything about you. Oh, yes, there will. You ask about me, you know it. Not that I care, because I can see him myself any time I really want to. He always talks about me when he's had a drink or two. Who told you that? Oh, lots of people. There is such a thing as being loyal, darling. Everybody knows how he treated me, if you don't. Do they? Oh, I've been over the jump. I'm not complaining. There are ways of doing everything. There are ways of being a gentleman. Joe Stowe is the nearest thing you ever came to seeing a gentleman. Oh, is he really, darling? Yes, Jim. Oh, I should think the least thing a gentleman could do is to see that his former wife isn't starving when he's making 150000 a year. You never missed a meal, honeybee. It isn't his fault, I haven't. You said you didn't want a nickel from him. You kept saying it to the lawyers all the time. Well, how could I get you to be successful? Listen, honeybee. Joe's been a friend of mine for quite a while, and he's going to keep on being one. You're not going to stop it, so just forget about Joe took a beating when he was with you, and he's well out of it, and he knows it. Oh, he does, does he? Oh, when you see Joe, you tell him to me that I am well out of it, too. Tell him he doesn't know what love is. Tell him. Well, skip it. Getting to the Jacobs now. Jim. Yeah? Jim, do you think Joe still loves you? Skip it, honey bee. Here's the Jacobs. And you're not coming in? No. Nope. Bye, Bella. Darling, uh, you're awfully sweet. There's no one as sweet as you, what is it you want now, honey bee? Jim, where could I get you if I want to tomorrow or the next day on the telephone? What's the matter? Afraid you're going to get into a jam? No, of course not. You better come across. What are you up to, Bella? There's nothing but a silly question. What makes you ask? Because you said you couldn't go on like this. But darling, I say that all the time. All the girls say that. It's none of my business, but I'd look out for Mr. Howard Berg if I were you, sweetness. I'll be in New York, my agents, tomorrow, the next day, and perhaps the next time. Be careful, though, Bella. Take a little solid food before you have any cocktails. Oh, be careful yourself. Here's Howard Berg now. He's waiting for me. That's nice. Hello, Bella. Hello. Jim, please, please. Well to see you here, Mr. Corner. Hello, Howard. Susie, Susie, hello, Susie. Jim, I'm going to run up and say hello to Susie, Jack. Uh, goodbye, darling. Bye, Bella. Aren't you getting out, Mr. Corner? No, uh... I call you Howard. I an engagement in Boston. Oh. By the way, I got a call, Howard, from a garage on the main road. The man there says he made some repairs on your car last weekend. He thinks you may have forgotten it. I, you know how these people are. Just two jumps ahead of the sheriff. Well, that bill was paid the first of the month. Oh. If you give me the name and address, I'll send out another check tomorrow. Thanks for telling me. I don't like things like that. Please get this. I pay my bills. I pay them promptly. Then you haven't minded my bringing it up, Howard. No, I appreciate it fully. Well, I must be going. So long, Bert. So long. Hello, Jim. How are you? Hello. George, it's good to see you. Well, Joe, how are you? Oh, just the same. Nothing changes much. Same old place. Same old faces. Oh, cheer up, Joe. The world's better than it used to be. Oh, it isn't. Absolutely the same. Listen, Joe, aren't you better off than you were three years ago? <laughs> Darn well right I'm better off. It's like being out of prison. It's like being alive again. <laughs> Sorry, I... I didn't mean to say it quite that way, but you know what I mean. All right, go ahead and say it. All right. Blast the brill. I still feel that way. They tried to ruin me. 
They tried to take out my heart and lungs and liver and stuff me with sawdust. They didn't mean to do that. They couldn't help it, Oh, I can see them now, them in their house. I'll bet there's still that same muddy smell from the river. And the trees are greener than anywhere else. And the hummingbirds keep buzzing in the trumpet vines. And the plumbing gets out of order all the time. And the cat has kittens. And everybody's unhappy in the parlor. And Sid has indigestion. And nobody's able to stand it anymore. (laughs) It isn't good for you to hang around that place, Jim. You ought to get out. Let's go away somewhere. Cousin Clotilde told me to give you her love. Hmm. That was good of her. Jim, I... I wish I didn't keep worrying about Bella every now and then. Bella's all right. She isn't going to kill herself. She never gave a hang about you, really. Bella doesn't give a hang for anything. She isn't made that way. She can't take time out caring for anybody because she has too much trouble looking out for Uh, herself. You needn't be so rough on her, Jim. If you won't stand up for Bella, I will. Don't worry, though. Always be somebody to stand up for Bella. You're well out of it, Joe. If she ever calls you up, don't answer. If you ever see her across the street... You know, Jim, might have been all right. What might have been? Bella and me. Oh, don't fool yourself, Joe. We all get exactly what's coming to us. You ought to know by this time that there's no such thing as might have been. It would always be the same. All right, Jim. Let's go in there. I'm getting hungry. Thanks, Pat. Well, Jim, aren't you going to kiss me? What about your maid, Pat? Don't you think that... I guess she can stand it if I can. I'm awfully glad to see you, Jim. Darling. Pat, we ought to cut this out. Why? Because you're a nice girl. It doesn't look well, Pat. I don't want you to be talked about. Well, you're a nice boy, too. That is as nice as any boy can be when he gets to be your age. I can stand it if you can, Jim. Pat, I don't want you to stand it. Darling, you need me to look after you. I don't want you to look after me. Give me another kiss and sit down and finish your brandy. All right. It's going to rain. I don't care, do you? No, let's stay out here on the terrace. It won't rain for a while. Darling, tell me about Whitford Point. Whitford Point? What do you want to know? Everything. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's always been part of me. It's still part of me. You know, then must be awfully queer. I suppose that's why you're so queer about things, Jim. Yeah, am I queer? Yes, in a way you are. <laughs> suppose you take take me apart a little more. <laughs> I don't want to. You're all apart already. <laughs> but just the same, you seem to go. And I like the way you go. Darling, would you ever take me down there to Whitford Point? Or would you be embarrassed? Oh, you. I'm going down Friday night. You'd better come along. Oh, it would be fun, wouldn't it? Oh, tell me about it, Jim. If you'd tell me about it, maybe I could understand. All right. Well, there's something strange about that place. Something you'll notice the minute you get there. It's, it's like a crowded room. There have been too many people at Wickford Point. Sometimes I think... Nothing that's ever happened at Wickford Point has ever entirely left it. And the parts of everything which has happened there are always waiting, ready to move forward out of nowhere when they're least expecting. There were three sisters living at Wickford Point. My great aunts, Clethra, Georgiana, Sarah. And Aunt Sarah was over 80. She was still a good hand with an axe. I remember as a little boy watching her go into the woodshed, take off her shawl and poke bonnet and mittens and cut short sticks for the parlor fireplace. One of the branches of the great elm by the front door was twisted because Aunt Sarah's mother used to have a pig hung from it in the winter. Aunt Sarah read me all the Waverly novels, and sometimes she'd read me out of the essays Dear Waldo had written. That was what she called Ralph Waldo Emerson, a friend of John Brill, the Wickford sage who used to row across the river to visit my great aunt's. It was his son, Hugh Brill, who rode across that same river years later and married my cousin Clotilde. That was the beginning of the Brills. (laughs) I remember what my grandfather said to me. I remember 
When he heard I wanted to live at Wickford Point and be a farmer, he said, I was about eight then. Farm, my boy, nonsense. This isn't a farm. It's a white elephant. Eat up money faster than I can make it. You get those ideas out of your head, Jim. They were all going barefoot when I came to Wickford Point. You like to wear shoes, don't you? Well, Grandpa, I like to. Tell me you want to be a poet like old Brill, the Wickford sage, grow a beard, look for huckleberries. No, indeed. You could learn something about money if I can arrange it. Somebody's got to know about money beside me. I can't support the whole family. Grandpa, I support the whole family. They don't even know it. Just take it for granted I should support them. Your grandmother was a beauty like your cousin Clotilde. (laughs) I remember the first day I ever came here to Whitford Point. They were sitting under the big apple tree on the lawn playing quotations. They asked me to stay to supper. Then they found there wasn't any supper. They took your Aunt Sarah down the carry-on and bought some. That was 40 years ago. I've been buying everybody's supper ever since. When I die, I'll still be paying for that supper. If there's any money left. The last few years, Aunt Sarah's mind began to wander. It was occupied with vanished personalities, and ghosts were always walking with her. I remember the first time I took Joe Stowe down to Whitford Point. When she saw him, she took off her glasses and blinked and smiled. Aunt Sarah. Aunt Sarah, Jim's home from college and he's brought a friend. Uh, yes. Y- yes, indeed. Come here and kiss me, Henry. No, no, it isn't Henry, Aunt Sarah. It's hmm? Jim. Jim, Henry's son. And he's brought a friend from college. Joe Stowe. It doesn't signify I know Henry when I see him, but I didn't know he was bringing Robert with him. I had thought that Robert was in China. It isn't Robert, Aunt Sarah. It's hmm? a friend of mine, Mr. Stowe. Hmm, well, well, it doesn't really signify... Robert is coming back from China this month. I suppose the Meredith were there. Uh, how are matters on the island? I do hope the Queen is learning her alphabet. Uh, yeah. y- yes, the uh, Queen can almost read by now. Dear Queen, I suppose you put in at the Ivory Coast. Uh, yes, The we owners did. must be very pleased. Very pleased indeed with you, Robert. Aunt Sarah, this hmm? is Mr. Stowe. It's hmm? Jim's friend from college. And it's time for you to go upstairs now. Uh, well... Well, it doesn't signify. I should admire not to have you continually interrupt me, Susan. It doesn't signify. He's made the voyage. Everything that I've said remains absolutely true. Good night. When Aunt Sarah died, it turned out that Aunt Sarah had left her share of the place to me. And strange enough, after I really owned part of the place, I didn't come back for years. There was the war, and after the war, I spent a couple of years working as a correspondent in China. And when I came back, nothing and everything was changed. Bella was grown up. The house was full of Harvard boys in love with her, and everyone at Wickford Point seemed to know a good deal more about China than I did, so there was no need for me to speak. I was back in my old room next to Bella's. The first night I was back, my door opened gently, and Bella came in. I know she was wearing the icy blue robe I'd given her and the little embroidered slippers I'd sent her from Shanghai. And her black hair fell in two braids over her shoulders, just as she'd worn it when she was a little girl. Hello. What's the matter, Belle? Can't you go to sleep? Yes. Button this thing the right way for me, won't you, darling? I got to sleep and then I woke up and remembered that I hadn't said goodnight to you at all. Button the darn thing up, please, darling. There you are. Jim, you're going to stay now, aren't you, darling? You're not going to leave us, are you? No, not for a while. I was afraid you might. You see how everything is, don't you? Yes, I see how it is. Jim, kiss me. I'll feel better if you'll kiss me, dear. Jim, someone's got to help me. You're the only one. All right, I'll help you, Belle. I'm so afraid. Don't be afraid. Too beautiful to be afraid. (laughs) Jim, I've got to get out of this. I can't stand it, Jim. I'll be getting like them, like Patel and Sid and the rest of them. I'm getting more like them all the time. How do you mean? You have to be like them in a way because you're one of them. You're a brill, Bella. I can't get away from that. Bella, what is it? You're worried about something. Is it that boy from Harvard who was here this evening? Do you love him, Bill? I don't know. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Jim, I wish I knew. If you did, you would. Looks like a nice boy. Does he want to marry you? He wants me to marry him right away. Is there any money? Of course, he's everything I ought to want. 
How does it feel when he kisses you? Oh, he feels just fine. Good. Mm-hmm. He's so gentle. He's so darling, Jim. Oh, I'm so mixed up. Sometimes I think I'm not fit for him, and then when he's away, I miss him. And then I want to marry him, and then I don't. And everybody's trying to stop me. You're trying to stop me. Oh, Jim. for heaven's sake, stop thinking about yourself, darling. Go to bed now. Good night. Darling, please don't be so cross with me. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't mean half of what I say. Aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? You want everything, don't you, Bill? Darling, you better get out of here. Jim, you'll stand by me, won't you? You're the only one who understands me. Jim. Yes? Jim, if I don't want to marry him, will you take me away somewhere? Not Italy, but some place where people wear queer clothes. Jim, you will take me away, won't you, darling? face another world. They live in a strange land called Wickford Point, the land of a great belief that they are brills. Brills, unlike other people, and very, very remarkable. And yet they're afraid. Yes. Yes, they're afraid. Clotilde, Sid, Bella, all of them. They're all afraid. Campbell Playhouse presentation of Wickford Point, starring Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Chapel, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment or two, we will resume our presentation of Wickford Point. But first, may I say a special word to the ladies. It's an evidence of the discriminating taste of homemakers throughout the country to see how quickly they respond to improvements in the taste and flavor of food. Whenever we discover that a change in recipe or even a change in the method of preparation will improve the flavor of any of our soups and make it more delicious, that change is made at once. But long before our advertising tells of the change or improvement, the news about it spreads across the land. Some time back, for example, when Campbell's chicken soup was made so much better, so much more delicious than ever before, women all over the country told their grocers about it. And many of these women wrote letters of approval directly to us. We knew further by their purchases that the word was spreading, for we were being called upon to make more and more chicken soup every week. And this is why we're so confident that if you buy Campbell's chicken soup from your grocer tomorrow, you'll be so pleased with it that you'll have it again and again. Now we resume the Campbell Playhouse presentation of J.P. Marquand's story, Wickford Point, starring Orson Welles. Oh, we're really going to have that thunderstorm. Yes, yeah, get over with Thunderstorms always act as though they were some darn important. <laughs> Let's stay right here where we are until it stops. You keep on telling me some more. What was it you were talking about? Weren't you listening? Yes, I was listening. But I was thinking about you. And I was talking about Bella. Jim, will you really take me to Whitford Point? I'd like to see them there. When can you leave? Friday night. Then we we'll drive up. Why do you want to go there? Well, I, I don't know exactly. But I really would like to. Will they all be there, Jim? All the birds? Oh, yes, they'll all be there. When did you last see Bella Bird, Jim? 
Well, I saw Bella yesterday. She's right there. Oh, it isn't Daisy. When did she get here? Who? Bella Brill. When did she get here? Oh, I don't see what you mean. Bella isn't here. I, I, I left her up at the Jacobs in Boston. My dear, she isn't there because she's here in New York. I saw her this afternoon on 42nd Street with a man. You did? What's the matter, Jim? Well, nothing. Nothing much. I just remembered she wanted to know where she could reach me if she needed me. They're always after you, aren't they? Yeah. If I needed you, you'd need me, wouldn't you? No, Pat, not exactly. You would, wouldn't you? I don't know. I'd help her. I'd help her out of anything. That's one thing about you. You always tell the truth. I don't care much what happens as long as you tell the truth. I wonder why you'd help her. Do you know? Yes, that's easy. I'd help her because I always have. It's the only reason. You're worried about her, aren't you? Well, go ahead. Doesn't make me mad, particularly. Something's going on. That man, do you remember what he looked like? Yes, he was tall, dark, and rather handsome. With a hard face. The oh. sort of man you see in nightclub dancing. Snappy dresser? Yes, a very snappy dresser. Did you ever hear of a Mr. Howard Berg, a big power in Wall Street? That's what Bella says he is. No, did you? Well, that man was certainly Mr. Howard Berg. Never mind, Mr. Berg, Jim. Tell right. me, go on. Tell me more about the bill. Tell me about her, Bella. How she married Joe Stowe. Well, we just heard how she married Joe Stowe. She brought him back with her from Rome. Joe happened to be in Rome that same year. Paper. I don't know quite how it happened. The young man from Harvard just drifted out of the picture. That's the way it was with the Brills. Things just happened. We weren't any too clear about anything. Wickford Point was like a floating island that once had been solidly attached to the mainland. That's the only way I can describe it. I can see it being severed from reality when I was still very young and drifting off a self-contained entity into a misty sea. Jim, I know it. What? It's Bella. Bella's dead. Sid, you open it. You've got a clear head and you can tell us if it's anything terrible. I never did like telegrams. They're unhappy things. Uh, Jim, please keep holding my hand. Uh, she says she's coming home. She's going to be married. What's that? <clears throat> Returning May 4th. Dreadfully, dreadfully happy. Going to marry Joe Stowe. Love, Bella. Joe Stowe. He's a friend oh, Joe, of yours, isn't he? You remember Joe Stowe. the best news I've heard since the armistice. Sid, will you get me a glass of water from the pantry and you know, aspirin? I think it's perfectly said. dreadful. It'll take her away somewhere. Cousin Cotillard, you used to like him. I don't see why you think it's so dreadful. Well, did you know? I never thought he was distinguished. Well, how can you say that? You haven't seen him for years and years. He'll take her away from everything she has. Well, suppose he does. That's exactly why she's marrying him, because she wants to get away from everything she has, yes, just as yeah, you say. Perhaps she does, but Bella wouldn't be anyone without her own tradition. What do you mean by tradition? Oh, I wish she wouldn't be so tired. And dear, tradition is what we're taught to live for. Bella's tradition is what she's been taught to live for. Will you please give me a cigarette, Cousin dear? Cousin Clotilde, I sometimes wonder just what you do live for. I live for the children and for other people, dear. I don't do it very well. I'm a very careless manager because no one could ever teach me to add or subtract in school. But I try all the time to make the children and other people happy. Well, how about Bella? Perhaps she wants to make somebody happy, too. Perhaps she wants to do something for Joe Stowe. Well, I'd about like that? to know what Mr. Stowe is going to do for her. They haven't the same tradition. Oh, tradition. He isn't going to fit in. He's going to... He's going to do what? Darling, don't ask me what I mean. I'm going to my room. He's going to try and take Bella away. Uh, Jim, uh, when Joe Stowe comes back, I think you ought to tell him. Someone ought to tell him. Tell him what? Well, the way Mother feels. She's always right. He shouldn't marry Bella, Jim. Absolutely isn't going to work. You know a lot about it, don't you, Sid? Well, now, listen. We don't like him, Jim. In fact, we hate him. It's going to be impossible if we all hate him. Oh, you're crazy. You've hardly ever seen Joe Stowe. None of you have seen him. How can you hate him? Well, it isn't attractive, Jim. I know it isn't attractive. Have you ever seen a lot of dogs? What have dogs got to do with it? Well, now, look at it this way, Jim. The Brills are all a very funny breed of dogs, inbred and overbred. I never did like dogs, and I haven't much respect for human beings either. What are you trying to say, Sid? When a new dog comes, the others hate him, don't they? Particularly when they're abnormal dogs. Well... Joe Stowe's a new dog. We don't like him. We'll never like him. We won't like him because he's new and because he's abler than we are. You can't help it, Jim. We're just going to hate him. I suppose Bella loves him. Oh, no, no. That doesn't sound like Bella. Well, perhaps he loves her. Well, have him help him if he does. They were 
married that fall. Sid was right about her marriage. I suppose, in a way, she couldn't help the things she did to Joe. Well, it lasted four years altogether, and then there was another year before she finally went to Reno. They should have broken off years before. Must have known it wouldn't work, but it's always hard to stop when you've started. Listen to the rain, Jim. Yeah. That started too. The whole roof's wet. Suppose we'd better go in. I'm afraid so. Let's take the chance. Hey, Pat, it's your phone ringing. I'll take it. All right. You think it's for you? Does anybody know you're here? I don't think so. Hello? Yes? Yes, he's here. Just a minute. It's your cousin, Jim. My cousin? You... Bella Brill. How on earth did she know? She must have caught... Hello? Yes, Bella? What? What? Pat, I'm sorry. I... I know what you think. Do you, Jim? I wonder. I have to go, really. She seems to be in a really bad mess this time. Pat, you don't hate me, do you? You're going to take me to Whitford Point this weekend? I said I would. I'll call you in the morning. Goodbye now. Goodbye, dear. Hello? Bella called me up. Where is she? I didn't expect to find you here. Well? What's the matter? Not a thing. What makes you think there is? Where's Bella? The other room. So she called you up, did she? That's what she was doing. Well, she can get in the whole fire department and lights that, too, but I'm... Oh, darling. I'm so glad you've come. You must understand that nothing Mr. Berg says is true. It's all preposterous. What have you been doing this time, Bella? It's Howard, darling. Howard is being perfectly preposterous. You said that before, Bella, and you've said it enough. You're not going to talk yourself out of this. You see, Jim, it's perfectly impossible. You won't listen to reason. Suppose you try to tell me. All right. Here's the way it is. I've been good enough to dance with Bella and take her places as long as I paid enough. Now it turns out I wasn't good enough for anything else. And last night she lied to me and went off with somebody that was good enough. Not quite nice, right, Bella? I don't quite gather what you think you can do about it, Berg. Well, I'll tell you what I can do about it. I don't care what people say about me, and I think Bella cares a good deal what they say about her. That gives me quite an advantage, doesn't it? It certainly does. Just as a matter of personal satisfaction, Bella's going with me to Bermuda. The boat leaves at 2 o'clock. That's what she said she'd do when we flew down from the Jekylls yesterday afternoon, and that's what she's going to do. For once in her life, she's going to pay for something. You know, Berg, that's rather an unusual idea. Well, that's my business, I mean it. Darling, you see, he's mad, and... Well, it's almost blackmail or something, darling. Don't you see? You'll have to do something about it. Suppose you stop calling me darling. I go to your room, pack your bags. Jim, are you crazy? It's half past eleven. You want to look attractive on the boat? Go on, get out of here. Did you see Mr. Berg means what he says? I wouldn't stay in the room with you. I don't want to. I know what you think of me. You needn't bother to tell me. Well, that's all right, Mr. Berg. Don't have it on your mind. She'll go with you if she's sensible. You can do it, she... She likes about it, what you like. I don't care. I'm rather surprised you take it this way. So am I. Well, it doesn't make much difference. I'm I'm sorry she got you here. Why? Frankly, the whole thing doesn't give me much satisfaction. You see, I was under the impression until last night that Bella was going to marry me, and then because I asked her exactly when, she threw me over. So you really wanted to marry her? Yes, I was that much of a fool. If I were you, I wouldn't fall in love with her again. She'll... Try to get you back again sometime or other. You see, she just wants everything at once. It isn't worth anyone's trouble, actually. Are you trying to give me some good, sound advice? No, no, I'm just telling you it isn't worthwhile. It's all a waste of time because you don't get anything back. Why not? Because she hasn't got anything to give. You think she has, but she hasn't. It's their fault. I suppose you'll think you've talked me out of it. I told you I didn't care, and I don't care. She had it coming to her. Well, forget it. I'll be going now. Where? Just checking out, getting on my way. Uh, I guess you're right. It isn't worth my time. You're really going? Yes, absolutely. Let's forget it, shall we? Yes, Berg, let's forget it. Well, so long. Bella, you can come out now. Mr. Berg is gone. When 
not angry with me, are you? No, not particularly. You won't tell, will you? No. Just why did you come down here? Well, I was at the jail. And you didn't stay. I'm just wondering if you ever meant to stay. If you don't believe me, I can't make you. Oh, Jim, isn't it perfectly logical that I should want to get away? You keep wanting to get away. I just can't stand it. It was the point all the time. It gets me nearly frantic to see them sitting around and talking. I can't stand it, and I won't. You said all that before, Belle. Can't stand anything. Life well, hasn't been fair to me, Jim, and it isn't because I haven't tried. But you see it, don't you? Nothing has come back to me. That's what makes me frightened. That's why I did what I did yesterday, darling. I don't want anyone like Howard Begg when I understood he thought we were engaged. It, it really did upset me. It, it just made me realize that I I didn't have anything at all. And I'm getting old. Jim, aren't you feeling well? You're not listening. Yes, I'm listening, Bill. Well, you don't think I'm getting old, do you? No. You're the prettiest girl I know. Oh. Then it's all right, isn't it? You see why I came down here, and that all this didn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, remember the games we used to play at parties? What is the matter? You're not listening, darling. I'm sorry, Belle. What game? You know, Patil used to have it when I had birthday parties. All the chairs were back to back, and the music would play, and we'd walk around them, and the music would stop, and we'd all sit down, except one of us would be left. Well... The music nearly stopped. So it's nearly stopped. Yes. You see what I mean? Well, sweetness, a lot of nice boys have offered you a chair. I remember another game where someone offers you a chair and asks you to sit down, and just when you're starting to, he pulls it out from under you and you go down, boom. You never had that happen to you, have you? Oh, that's love. You know what I mean. I, I mean, I haven't anything. Not anything left. Except you. I'll always have you, darling. I think I care more about that than anything else in the world. I mean, you really care. And we quarrel and we fight, but you tell me what you think of me. You're still with me. Aren't you, Jim? Bell. Aren't you, Jim? Bell. I've always told you the truth. I've never thought of you exactly like this. You've always been a sort of habit up to now. That's it. It's habit, darling. Well, it isn't anymore. I'm through, Bell. I'm sorry, but I'm absolutely through. Oh, I knew you were cross, darling. I, I don't blame you for being tired of me. I'm pretty tired of myself. I'm sorry, Belle. I didn't say I was tired. I said that I was through. Darling, just tell me what I've done. There's no use talking about it, Bill. I'm through. You don't like me? You don't like me at all? It's worse than that. I feel impersonal. I can see what your good points and your bad points are, and I don't care. I'm sorry, Belle. Oh, stop saying you're sorry and tell me what's the It isn't your fault. It's just the way things are. You haven't got anything to give to anyone that anyone wants. I didn't mean exactly that, Bill. Now, don't throw that grass. You'll be sorry. Don't do that again, Bill. Jim. I'm sorry, darling. You just made me so mad. I'm so afraid, darling. And you know I always tell you everything. I'll go. No, I'll go. Hello. Hello. Joe, how'd you get here? Fellow sent me a wire. Thought you were in Vermont, Joe. I was in Vermont. Oh. Airplane, I hired one. Now, run along, Jim. Bella and I have something particular to say to each other. There's one thing you didn't tell me, Bella, that you wired Joe. Oh, Jim, I... So, all she had to do was whistle. Yeah, she only had to whistle. Uh, run along now, Jim. You act as though I wanted to stay. Go ahead, Joe. Make a fool of yourself. Go ahead if you want to get mixed up again. Well, that's, that's about enough from you. I don't want to get mad at you, Jim. Sorry. Getting just what's coming to you. Well, go ahead. Live it all over again. First thing, I don't care. Well, that suits me. If we do it all over, we can do it without you this time. You're going to, Joe. No. No, Jim. I, I want you to stay. Really, Jim. I, I'm such an awful fool, you know. I, I never can do things right. You're know, both of you so patient. Never mind it, Bill. Darling, I'm so ashamed. Where's your handkerchief? You have it in your hand. Don't you see what I'm saying, Joe? No, don't you see? It won't do any good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Bella. You and I can make it just the way it was if both of us really try. Oh, that's what you always kept hoping, dear, wasn't it? Well, we can't. It wouldn't be fair to try because I... 
I don't want you enough, Joe. I thought I did, but I don't. You don't know what you want right now, Belle. Let's talk about it later. Don't talk like that. You always talk like that. I, I do know what I want, and I, I don't want you, Joe. I don't want you because... What do you make me say it for? Why do you just look at me and make me? I, I don't want you, Joe, because I want Jim. Bella. I only want Jim. And he says he doesn't want me. How do you suppose she does want him? Cosmos. And I hired an airplane to get here. The second one of those little paper bags. Hire another, Joe. It's the first break you've had in quite a while. You're out of it for good now. Get that into your head. You're out of it for good. It's the first generous thing I ever saw do. I guess it's been you, Jim, all the time. You think that... Oh, no. No, I don't think you're too timey. It's... it's just that way. You even wish her off on me, Joe. Oh, that's pretty hard. Maybe it's time something was hard on her. Jim, you couldn't... No, definitely not. Jim, let's get away somewhere. Where? Anywhere. There, there's Spain. I never did like Spain. All right, I don't care. There are other places. Lots of them. What's the matter, Jim? You're getting soft. Don't you want to go? I don't know. Is there something you haven't told me? Yes, but not about Bella, Joe. I knew there was something. That's a fine way not to tell your friends. I'll tell you about it later. Well... Change your mind, you know where to get. Yes, I know. The message. Yes. It's no worse than it's ever been. Uh, see you later. So long, Joe. Good luck. Yeah. I sent him away, didn't I? Yes, you did. I didn't have to. No, that's true. Darling, it was, it was what you wanted, wasn't it? I didn't ask you to. But it was what you wanted, wasn't it? That's why I did it, darling. I'm very much obliged. Bella, maybe it makes you feel better. I hope so. Why? Because you've done something decent. You, you like me better, don't you? Yes, honey bee, I like you a good deal, Bella. You've been very generous. Oh, you didn't mean those things you said. You take them back now. Let's don't you, forget darling? about it, darling. Only that we've both been fighting. Oh. So it didn't do any good? No, you're wrong, Bella. It's done a lot of good. You're nicer than you've ever been right now. It's like an operation, darling. I, I feel so weak. My head keeps going around. You'll be kind to me anyway, won't you? Anyway. Yes, of course. I feel so unattractive. Let's go somewhere and have lunch and have some champagne. All right, now, but you'd better pack. Why? Because you've done enough for one day, sweetness. I'm going to send you back to Wickford Point. Oh, that's all that ever happens, no matter what we do. I always go back to Wickford Point. Well, there it is, Pat, down below there. The roofs, the hay barns, and the chimneys of the house. That's Wickford Point. Pat, can you smell the smell of the river, the warm, muddy smell? Down? You're excited, aren't you, Jim? Yeah. Every time I come back, there's the excitement of finding it still there waiting for me. You hear the wind in the pines? I used to come up here to this point as a child. There was the same soft wind, the same whispering, laughing among the trees. It hasn't changed at all. Jim. Yes, Pat? Jim, they haven't got you yet. You love me. I wish I didn't sometimes. Why, Jim? I don't know. I guess I'm afraid. Afraid? Myself. You know what I mean. Jim, we can't go on like no, this. No, I don't see how we can. Do you mind if I ask you something? Anything you like. All this about Whitford Point. This feeling you have about not being able to escape. You're not saying this on account of Bella, are you? Bella? It isn't Bella you're talking about. You will tell me the truth, won't you? No. I don't mind if it hurts. It's not Bella. Oh, I'm glad. I'm so glad, dear. Jim, I wish you'd put your arm around me. I feel a little dizzy. Pat, are you crying? No, not really. Women just have different ways of showing they're happy. Jim, if you really love me, if you really want me, let's go away tonight. Now. 
Don't let's go down to the house. But you said you wanted to see the house. I've changed my mind, Jim. It's our only chance to get away from here now, tonight. I want you to marry me, Jim. It wouldn't be so bad for you. Not as such things go. I'd make you happy. Pat, I'd go twice around the world with you tomorrow. There's nothing I'd like better. And farther than that? Farther than that. I'd go anywhere, you say, and as long as you like, but... Finally, dear, I'd always come back here, and you couldn't stop me, and I couldn't stop myself. You know that. You wouldn't like it. I'll take my chance on that, Jim. I want you to come away with me now, while you're free, and while I'm with you. If we don't go away tonight, we'll never go. It's our only chance. Pat. I know I'm right, darling. Pat. We've got to choose, Jim, now, tonight. It's me or the bills. It's me or what's the point? Listen, Pat, listen. Listen to the wind in those trees. They're talking about me at this moment. Hmm? About you and me. Listen to their voices. You, you hear what they're saying? My dear, they're saying, don't tell me you've never heard the most amazing thing like so many others. Why, look who's out here now. Jim Calder and somebody new. Somebody who doesn't belong here. Listen now, they're laughing together. Do you know what they're saying now? Jim, Jim, he's changed, but he can't change. He's tried to forget us, but he won't forget. It doesn't matter where he goes. He's out here half the time under the trees at Whitford Point. Even when he's away, he's always here because... Because we caught him as a boy. It doesn't matter where he dies, he'll be back here. He'll always be back. I told you I'm not afraid of that, Jim. It's the present I'm thinking of, not the past or the future. If you want me, Jim, you've got to turn this car back. I've got to leave this place tonight. Campbell Playhouse presentation of Wickford Point, starring Orson Welles. In just a moment, Mr. Welles will return to the microphone, bringing with him tonight's author, Mr. John P. Marquand. But in the meantime, a word from Ernest Chappell. As I said a little while ago, you and your family can enjoy the good taste of chicken any time just by serving Campbell's Chicken Soup. You see, it's made the good old-fashioned way. Campbell's chefs use all of the meat of government-certified plump chickens. Then they simmer the broth long and slowly until it positively glistens with golden richness and delicious chicken flavor abounds in every spoonful. And they add snowy rice and pieces of chicken, chicken so tender it almost melts in your mouth. But after all, the proof is in the eating. So why not have it this weekend? Because just as sure as you like chicken you like Campbell's chicken soup. And here is Orson Welles. Well, ladies and gentlemen, John Phillips Marquand, author of Wickford Point, uh, is, I'm told, a widely traveled man, and a man, moreover, and I can vouch for this, who is able to get very sharp impressions of the places he visits and the people he sees. He translates his observations into story form with such vividness that he's been generally charged with copying directly from life. In the case of the Pulitzer Prize novel, the late George Apley, the fame of the fictional character grew so great that Harvard University made the non-existent Mr. Apley a member of the class of 1887. So far, four towns have claimed to be the site of Wickford Point, and numerous families and individuals think they are right there in the book. There is indeed a story told in Boston of a lady who bustled into a bookstore and said, I just can't believe it's all true. I'm sure Mr. Marquand uh, must have made some of it up himself. Now, what about this, Mr. Marquand? Tell us the truth about these famous characters of yours. Are they real people? Well, Mr. Wells, 
I might answer you with what is written on the flyleaf of all novels these days. I know what you mean. All the incidents and characters in this novel are entirely fictitious. No reference is intended to any actual person living or dead. Am I correct? In a way, that's what I mean, yes. But any character in a book is necessarily a composite of dozens of people. Living persons put into books are, curiously enough, not alive at all. They never fit into the dimensions of a plot. They are as much out of place on a book page as a fictional character would be if you saw him walking on the street. A good fictional character can never represent a living person. Strangely enough, even an incident you observe in life can seldom be transcribed into a book. If any living people see themselves in the pages of Wickford Point, I offer them my apologies. Well, at the moment, uh, frankly, Mr. Marquand, I'm not thinking of your New England people, but of another of your creations, another famous Marquand character. Uh, what about that incredible Japanese Mr. Moto? I hope there is such a fellow in the Far East, Mr. Marquand, busy with intrigue and international complications. But I suppose you invented him, too. Sorry I can't oblige you with Mr. Moto. He's a strictly fictional character. Well, Mr. Marquand, I'm going to exact a promise from you. Yes? Just before we finish tonight, I want to ask you, if Mr. Moto ever comes knocking at your door, please don't tell him he's a composite type. Mr. Marquand, just send for me. I want to meet him. And now, Mr. Wells, will you tell us, please, about next week's story? Well, next week, Mr. Chapel, New England turns the other cheek. From the sultry privacy of Wickford Point, we take you to the hardier groves of Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, and it's with great pleasure that we present for the first time on the air the play which last year won the highest dramatic award offered the American theater, Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize winner, Our Town, a play which does just what its title says shows you a typical small American town in the lives of two of its leading citizens. Their lives, how they lived, how they were married, how they had children, how their children in turn grew up and fell in love and married, and how some of them died. And so until next week, until our town, our sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse, remain obediently yours. <laughs> of Campbell's Soup, join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us at the Campbell Playhouse again next Friday evening for one of the most beautiful and moving plays that ever scored a four-star hit on Broadway for the first time on the air last season's Pulitzer Prize winner Our Town with John Craven of the New York stage cast. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed tonight's Campbell Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's Chicken Soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. Thank <laughs> you.